Good morning, all. Today's Bible reading is from uh, John uh, chapter 19, from verse 1 to uh, verse 16. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they struck him in the face. Once more Pilate came out and said to the Jews, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of the thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here is the man. As soon as the chief priest and their officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! But Pilate answered, You take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jews insisted, we have a law, and according to that law, we must die, because he claimed to be the son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid, and he went back inside the palace. Where do you come from? He asked Jesus. But Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said, Don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? Jesus answered, You would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free. But the Jews kept shouting, If you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judge's seat at a place known as the Stone Pavement, which in Aramaic is Gabbatha. It was the day of preparation of Passover week, about the sixth hour. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king? Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priest answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified, so the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Please help me by your spirit to preach faithfully this astonishing passage. Father, help us as your people to hear and to understand that we might know how to live as your people today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, when the Roman governor Pontius Pilate finally handed Jesus over to be crucified, he must have thought it would be the end for this troublesome, self-proclaimed king. And with Jesus dead, hopefully all the unrest caused by his annoying little messianic movement would die away too. But as 2,000 years of human history has shown, Pilate and those like him got it wrong. This wasn't the end for Jesus, this was only the beginning. And the fact that we're here today is evidence of that. Today on Easter Friday, we celebrate the fact that God sent his son into the world not to condemn the world but to save the world through him. What we have today is a message of surprising hope. 
The good news of Good Friday is that Jesus is the good king and shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. Unlike those bad shepherds who care only for themselves, Jesus says, I know my sheep and my sheep know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. He also says, the reason my Father loves me is because I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. You see, the remarkable thing about Jesus' death as we look at our passage today is that he is never out of control, not even for a moment. Not when he's being mocked and mistreated, not when he's being led away to be scourged and crucified, not even when he dies. Jesus is in control at every moment. He is perfectly in step with his Father's will and he is accomplishing through his own suffering a work of salvation for us. Just before in John chapter 18 verse 37 and if we can start here this morning, notice what Jesus says to Pilate. He says, for this reason I was born, this is verse 37 of chapter 18, for this reason I was born and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. It seems to me that this is a great challenge for us today as well, that we might be found on the side of truth, on the side of Christ in the events that happen in our passage and in our lives today. It is important that we believe the truth. The historical facts of what happened to Jesus matter. They must be true or we are wasting our time. And we as God's people need to tell the truth about sin and judgment and hell. We need to defend the gospel by which we can be saved from those truths and we need to live for Christ in a world that denies these truths. For Jesus said, everyone on the side of truth listens to me. But do I? Do I really Listen, believe and act on the truth that I know about Jesus my King. I want to talk about truth today. What is the truth about Jesus? The truth is that the truth is under attack. After Jesus was betrayed by Judas, we know that he was arrested on the Mount of Olives just outside Jerusalem. From there he was taken to see two of the most powerful men in Jerusalem, Annas and Caiaphas. His own disciples fled, left him alone. Peter denies Christ three times. Caiaphas was the high priest, Annas was his father-in-law and this kangaroo court was quickly assembled that they might judge Jesus. That same night, in a hastily arranged show trial, Jesus was found guilty of blasphemy and he was sentenced to death. But the Jews couldn't kill Jesus without the approval of the Roman governor of Jerusalem. So they took him to Pontius Pilate in the middle of the night and they asked Pilate to carry out the sentence on their behalf. But there's a problem. There was a problem. You see, Pilate didn't want to kill Jesus. It seems his conscience was telling him loudly and clearly that Jesus was an innocent man. Three times he tried to have Jesus released and three times the Jews cried out that he must be crucified. In verse 1 then, if you have a look at our passage today, chapter 19, verse 1, Pilate is actually trying not to kill Jesus. He's trying not to kill Jesus. It's true, but it's a dangerous game he's playing, isn't it? It's a dangerous game he's playing. He he knows that Jesus is innocent, but then he also wants to please the Jews. He wants to let Jesus go, but he doesn't want to look weak. So he has Jesus flogged in the hope that it will satisfy the Jews. The truth is under attack in verse 1. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged while his soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. 
And they clothed him in a purple robe, the colour of royalty, and went up to him again and again saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they struck him in the face. And usually at this point we're told to imagine the agony that Jesus must have suffered as he went through this brutality, as he experienced this mockery tied to a pole, whipped and beaten. The crown of thorns with those huge spikes, really an instrument of torture and a cruel form of mockery. And soon the father himself will turn his face away and pour out the full force of his wrath for the sins of the world upon his son. And Jesus Jesus will cry out, Father, forgive, for they do not know what they're doing. And such suffering is beyond anything we can comprehend. See, this is the truth about what happened to Jesus. But there's something else going on in our passage today as well. I'm looking at Pontius Pilate and his experience of these truths. Will he listen to his own conscience and defend the truth? Will he stand on the side of truth as Jesus urged him to? Or will he betray the truth and turn Jesus over to be crucified? You see, he has the power to do both, doesn't he? But the question is, which one will he choose? Today's passage is also about the testing of this man's soul. It's about Pilate's moral dilemma. A pilot's conscience is saying Jesus is innocent, but the public are saying crucify him. And Pilate's flip-flopping uncertainty is actually reflected in the passage by his own movements in and out of the palace, from a public space to a private space and back and forward and back and forward. So in verse 1, for example, Pilate is inside the palace. He's in the courtyard where Jesus was being flogged. But in verse 4, notice, he comes out of the palace. He comes out into public. He says to the Jews, look, I'm bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, here is the man. And verse 5, it simply says, here is the man. But I prefer the older and more dramatic version at this point. Behold the man. Look at him. I mean, seriously, look at him. Beaten and bleeding in front of you. Does this look like a son of God to you? Does this look like a king? Look at his body. Look at his blood. Oh, I tell you, I find no basis for a charge against him. Behold the man. Behold the man. Now, publicly, Pilate is the face of the Roman Empire and he wants to be tough on criminals. But privately, his conscience is troubling him. And publicly, he wants to align himself with the crowd and show contempt for Jesus, this man. Privately, he's afraid to follow through with it. Publicly, the stakes are high. Privately, he wants to let Jesus live. Now, this is a huge moral dilemma for Pilate and it's about to get even worse. For now, in verse 6, if you have a look, the Jews respond with a cold-blooded determination and they cry out, Crucify! Crucify! And this is my third point today. And still Pilate, he doesn't want to do it. He says to them, you take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. Do you see the the to and fro that's happening here? Well, the Jews are sensing blood now and in verse 7 they double down. They double down, they say, we have a law and according to that law he must die because he claimed to be the son of God. We have a law. And they're probably thinking of Leviticus chapter 24 verse 16 which says anyone who blasphemes the name of the Lord must be put to death. 
They knew their law when it suited them. We have a law, they insisted, and according to that law, Jesus must die because he claims to be the Son of God. We have a law, they insisted, and according to that law, Israel Folau must be banned for life because he says that sinners have to repent of their sins and turn to Jesus or face God's judgment and hell. But today in Australia, the law is being weaponised to attack and to silence Christians. And when the law is used by wicked people to crucify those more righteous than themselves, you know that we are facing a satanic attack. This abuse of the law is a grave danger to our society because it undermines the foundations of our freedom and makes our nation ungovernable. We have a law. Now, the latest word that people are using to describe this aggressive new strategy is lawfare. Lawfare. The use of the law as a weapon. And that's what we're facing increasingly today as we seek to proclaim the truth about Jesus. For example, in the case of Israel Folau and his run-in with Alan Joyce, the real person behind this, I suggest, I might call him the ruler of the kingdom of the air, CEO of Qantas, chief sponsor of Rugby Australia. Seems to me the ruler of the kingdom of the air hates Israel's God and he won't be happy until we're all following the ways of the world. Meanwhile, back in Jerusalem, Pilate is feeling like the meat in a Jewish sandwich. So far as he's concerned, this case involves a God he doesn't believe in, a nation he despises, a kingdom from another world and a holy man who refuses to answer the questions he asks. And in the midst of it all, Pilate must have been thinking, what did I do to deserve this? It was really tough and it called for the kind of political courage that few politicians seem to have. Now in verse 8, though, I find Pilate's next reaction really interesting because it shows that on the inside, Pilate is afraid of the truth. And this is my fourth point for today. Pilate is afraid of the truth. We saw earlier that Pilate is already feeling unnerved by Jesus. But when he hears that Jesus could be the Son of God, we're told that he becomes very definitely scared. Isn't that interesting? Could this blood-spattered man really be a king who is greater than Caesar? Could it be that Jesus has been telling the truth? Something deep inside him says that it is. Verse 8, when Pilate heard this, he became even more afraid. And he went back into the privacy of the palace, back inside, to have one last talk to Jesus because he's afraid. He's afraid of the truth. Where do you come from? What a question to ask. Can you see he's asking not just, oh, you know, which street, which block? You come from Nazareth, you come from Jerusalem. No, he's not. Where do you come from, Jesus? And Jesus gives him no answer. Because Pilate ought to know by now. But he needs to choose. Pilate needs to make a decision either to stand with the truth or to walk away. Now in verse 9, you see it's Jesus who is judging Pilate, not the other way around. Jesus is judging this man, testing him to see where he'll stand in relation to the truth. So now what would you do if you were in Pilate's shoes that day? Do you know your boss is expecting you to keep law and order? To deliver as expected? You're faced with this kind of moral dilemma, either to stand for the truth or to walk away? 
I imagine quite a lot of pressure was put on Israel Folau to retract his statements, to apologise. Oh, I got it wrong, I'm so sorry, I didn't really mean it. Would you be prepared to stand up in public and defend the truth, even at the cost of your career, even at the cost of your reputation? Do you see? That's the choice that Pilate had to make. And we know that Jesus bled like a man. We know that his thorny crown and his blood-stained robe were just a mockery of his claim to be the son of God. But Pilate is so close to the kingdom, he can reach out and touch it. He's right there, standing next to him. And this is his last chance to be surprised by hope. Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate asked. Don't you realise that I have the power either to free you or to crucify you? Won't you back down? Won't you deny your claim? I can set you free. Just say it isn't true that you're the son of God. Jesus' answer went like an arrow to the heart of the matter in our passage today. You would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. Pilate's not the most guilty person in our passage today. And Pilate knows what Jesus is saying is true, but he's a coward. He's a coward. He just lacks the courage of his convictions and that is his downfall. He's afraid of the truth. Despite all his appearance of power as the governor of Judea, Pontius Pilate is only a pawn in a greater political system, just as you and I are today. We all have our part to play in society. And now Jesus is saying to Pilate and he's saying to us here today as well, you need to trust me. My kingdom and my authority are higher than Caesar's. And I want you to follow me. I want you to stand with me in this society, in this world, at whatever price it takes. But Pilate has so much to lose. His wife enjoys the palace. It's a rather nice place. The money is good. He's got the reputation, governor of Judea, a good future ahead of him, great career path. If he can just deal with these troublesome Jews and find a way to set Jesus free. Pilate is so close to the kingdom, but he is not willing to face the humiliation of defending the truth about Jesus. In verse 12, Pilate now tries harder than ever to set Jesus free. But the Jewish leaders know his weakness and they play it to the hilt. If you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. For anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. And you can see the chess piece just going right there. Checkmate. They're right, aren't they? They speak the truth. If you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. No one can serve two kings. You have to choose. Ultimately, Pilate has to make the same decision you and I do. He has to choose who to serve. He has to decide who to trust Is it Caesar or is it Christ? In the end, Pilate's indecision leads him to make the wrong decision. He's desperately searching for that middle way, trying to work his way through the dilemma without having to totally give up either. Verse 13, when Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the judge's seat at the place known as the stone pavement. It was the day of preparation of Passover week, about the sixth hour. That's around midday. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. 
But they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify. So it's game over, but not for Jesus. Pilate knew the truth and he didn't defend him. The Jewish leaders denied the truth and they tried to suppress him. So they condemn themselves by their own confession in verse 15, don't they? Pilate asks, shall I crucify your king? He speaks the truth. And so do they. Look at what they say. Can you believe that the chief priests of Israel would say these words? We have no king but Caesar. My God, how the church has fallen. What about you? What about me? Who's your king today as you remember the death of Jesus? Are you someone who listens to the truth and knows that Jesus died for you? Excellent. Live it out. Or are you afraid of the truth like Pilate was? Vacillating, a foot in both camps, undecided. You know what's true but you're afraid to take that step of faith. Well, you need to take the step of faith, don't you? Perhaps you only want to worship God on your own terms or perhaps you know the truth but you lack the courage to live it and share it. You know, there are some people who offend God openly, like the Jewish leaders who weaponise God's law and they dare to say we have no king but Caesar. Many people in our society live like that today and there are some in the church who do it as well, like Bill Cruz. And then there are others who offend God in less obvious ways. By avoiding the truth and dodging responsibility, allowing evil to happen, not speaking up when they should, turning a blind eye to sin, washing their hands of the matter. It's so easy to do. Well, God is still glorified even in these awful events as the one whose word is faithful and true. At Easter we believe that God came into the world to testify to the truth and to surprise us with hope and he has done that. He has done that. Remember what Jesus said, for this reason I was born and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Are you listening to Jesus today? He is the way, the truth and the life and no one comes to the Father except through him. The good news of Good Friday is that Jesus has made God's love known to us like never before. He's died in your place, he's risen again for your justification and now it's time to decide for yourself, is Jesus really the king he claims to be? Does he really have the authority to forgive sins and to rule in your life? Is he really the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep? Or is he just a man who died 2,000 years ago, never to rise again? What do you believe is true? Well, if you haven't made a personal decision for Jesus in your life right now, then I urge you to do so. Make Good Friday the best Friday in your life and make a decision for Christ. I promise you won't regret it. If you want to do that, you just need to admit what you've done to God, confess that you have really not lived life the way that he has called you to. You need to believe the truth about who Jesus is and what he's done. You need to confess as in sharing that with others and you need to do something about it. It's easy as A, B, C, D. Admit, believe, confess and do. To everyone else I say, behold your king and love him as you ought. Listen to him because everyone on the side of truth listens to Jesus. And that's what our time of prayer and fasting is all about as a church. It's an opportunity for us as God's people to confess our complacency to our Heavenly Father and to admit the consequences of our inaction. We have not stood up for the truth. We have not been willing to suffer. We have not even been aware of the dangers half the time. 
And so we need to pray for our church, we need to pray for our nation and I urge you to join us to do that after morning tea today because I believe this election coming up in May is going to be the most important election perhaps in the history of our nation and we need to be wise how we vote. We need to pray that God doesn't give us what we deserve. Please join with me also in a season of Daniel-like prayer and fasting from today through to Easter Sunday. Set aside all the non-essentials. Eat just basic food. Turn off the telly. No non-essential internet use. Whatever it is that you can set aside so that you can devote yourself to prayer. Remember, we've just been reading Daniel. Go and have a look at Daniel chapter 9. See and read about what Daniel prayed and what Daniel did. He confessed his sins and the sins of the nation, and he begged God for mercy. Well, this Easter we need to do the same. We need to listen to Jesus and we need to pray to God, our Heavenly Father, for mercy and grace because we know the truth, don't we? But it's time to do something about it. So may God help us today and may he give us the joy of being counted worthy to suffer for his name And may we be numbered among those who stand for the truth in our generation. We need to tell the truth, defend the truth and live the truth as Jesus has called us to do. Let's pray. O Lord our God, we are so sorry for our complacency and our unwillingness to take a stand for you. Please forgive us. Thank you that you do not forsake us even when we fail. We pray that you would pour out your grace upon our church and our nation at this critical time in our history, that you would cause many to turn back to you and that the foundations of our society might be based on that higher authority which is based upon the living word of the living God who loves us to death. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.